The following is brought to you by Vertical Vet. Rethink your GPO. Hello, Vertical Vet family. I am Dr. Ernie Ward, Chief Veterinary Officer for Vertical Vet, and it is my highest honor and privilege to bring you to another fascinating episode of our Vet Med School. And this is where we give you the latest and the greatest in veterinary medicine. So if you're a veterinarian, an associate, a veterinary technician, or anybody in the veterinary healthcare team that's interested more in that deeper dive into medicine, definitely check out the Vet Med School. And today we're gonna to talk about a topic that we've explored in the past, but there's always new developments around cardiology in particular. And really today is gonna to be focused on what to do with that dog who has a cough and a heart murmur. And while at first this may seem like a really simple problem to solve, and many times there's a lot of co confounding comorbidities going on and things you may wanna do diagnostically and therapeutically to enhance your patient's outcomes. And so we've got no one better than Colorado State's very own Dr. Lance Visser. And he is originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan. He went up to Michigan State University, which is a fantastic vet school as we all know, where he did his DVM and master's degree. He then came back to the good side of the world at North Carolina State University, just up the road from where I am. And that's where he finished his small animal rotating internship. He then rolled right into his residency up at The Ohio State University, completing that in 2014. He's now an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences at Colorado State University, one of the most beautiful campuses in the entire country. And he is going to share with us the latest information on how to handle that pet patient, that dog patient that's got a cough and, and it's got a murmur. So Dr. Visser, thank you so much for spending time with us today. My absolute pleasure. Happy to be here. You know, and, and, and Lance, I've been a veterinary now for over 30 years, and this is a, a well-tread, you know, topic, right? I mean, a lot of people have talked about how do we manage the cough? How do we distinguish a cough from a cardiac origin versus something else? And, you know, what are the diagnostic tools? But it seems like every time I talk to folks like you, there's a new little wrinkle, a new twist that can enhance our patient outcomes. And so I guess just at the start of today's presentation, you know, what what are some of the latest and greatest sort of advances that you've seen over the past, you know, year or two, especially people that maybe didn't get to see a lot of uh, continuing ed education during COVID? COVID. Anything groundbreaking, you know, that really excites you? Yeah, in, in terms of the the coughing dog with a murmur, I think to, to that specific topic or our topic of today, I, I think the way I see it is over the last uh, five, 10 years, there's been some really interesting studies uh, kind of challenging what we once thought was the problem. And we were pretty sure that a lot of these dogs with a cough uh, and a loud heart murmur, that that coughing was due to congestive heart failure or pulmonary edema. Whereas there's some interesting work that that's kind of hard to ignore that that kind of makes at least us question that 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 dogma, so to speak, like not all of these dogs with big hearts uh, and a heart murmur. And obviously, I think it's pretty safe to assume we're, we're talking about the context of myxomatous mitral valve disease, but um, of course, other cardiac diseases can be associated with cough too. But that's that's kind of in a very general way to answer your question. That's what I would say. There's there's some interesting stuff always planting the seed of nuance. Right. And you're absolutely right. I mean, because historically we've associated coughing with pulmonary edema and other sequela to cardiac failure, right? It decreased output right. and so forth. And, and and I think that what we're really doing is going back to that old question of, well, wait a second, I don't see any or hear any pulmonary edema and the dog's still coughing. And yet I've got, you know, I don't know what to do. And, and you know, over the years, you know, we've tried a variety of, of therapeutic interventions, you know, back in the day, uh, Lance, Timoral P used to be one of my best fr friends yeah. when it came to managing a lot of these cases, and I'm sure you'll touch on the role of anti-inflammatories in some of these cases. But I guess for today's conversation, let's just start off as as we always do: is what are we talking about when we refer when you refer to the cardiac cough? And and again, what are some of those causes of again cardiac cough in dogs? Yeah, you bet. I think just I think that's a great way to start. So making sure we're on the same page at least. And it's not specifically my definition. This. This uh, has been borrowed from the literature, but I think that that's a great place to start. So a cardiac cough, I think, just so we're on the same page, that just in general would uh, imply it's a cough 
in a dog with cardiac disease. And I would just add clinically significant cardiac disease. So then that begs the question just to add a little bit more. Okay. Um, what's the mechanism behind that? You, you touched on it for many years, myself included during my, my formative training years, a lot, we assumed a lot of these dogs with a cough and clinically significant heart disease, meaning they've got a relatively loud murmur and cardiomegaly on x-rays or potentially ultrasound, that that's pulmonary edema. And I, I'm not going to take that away. I think that certainly still is a strong possibility. And in those uh, red lights should, should, should flash like, Hey, if this dog has a loud murmur, it's the typical older small breed dog, uh, and it's coughing this, I think congestive heart failure is still a really good differential or in other words, pulmonary edema, but kind of the, some evidence questioned that is there was one study really interesting that said dogs cough actually might go away or dogs in congestive heart failure might be less likely to cough than the ones not in heart failure. And that's just really interesting. But again, it doesn't make me say cough can't be caused by pulmonary edema. They brought up some interesting topics like there aren't actually cough receptors farther down in the lower airways where uh, pulmonary edema may occur within the alveoli. Um, so just interesting. Um, I still think it might be a cause of the cough, but there are certainly others. So, so could this be just a big heart compressing airways? Right. There's evidence that, that, that question that, and then could this be just an additional problem that these dogs get? Yeah, and like Lance, I'm really glad you brought up the, the receptors because that's been really uh, problematic for veterinarians for a long time because you know, when we look at the human literature, they describe this pretty acutely. You know, they, d This is a very co common you know, syndrome where these people are literally drowning in fluids and not right. coughing. So you get these weird paradoxes. But you know, getting back to that upper airway, you know, so suddenly now you look at where the bifurcation of the trachea is. We know there's tons of cough receptors there, as there should be. And so you get back to that old compression, you know, the compression of, of left main stem bronchi in, in this instance. But what, what about that? So so getting back to determining between like a true cardiogenic, you know, it's, it's caused by fluid accumulation or something primary. How do you go about distinguishing, you know, I guess I'm really trying to ask her, okay, so we got it, but what are some of the things clinically I could do to, to say this is more likely to be pulmonary edema uh, causing the cough versus not? Absolutely. And I think, I think that's a great question. And that kind of prompts two different approaches. One, in, in my opinion, the most important is, is the dog and the clinical signs and something that I'll probably chime on multiple times, even within this discussion is what's probably more specific to pulmonary edema or left-sided congestive heart failure in your typical dog with degenerative mitral valve disease is tachypnea as well as dyspnea. Now, hopefully it's pretty obvious to us when our patients are dysmic, um, that I'm not going to go into too much detail on, but probably from a clinical standpoint, what delineates a dog that has pulmonary edema the best versus a dog that doesn't, whether they're coughing or not, is resting or sleeping respiratory rate. Now it's hard when they're in the hospital um, because a lot of them are, are ramped up and tachypnic and excited. So a lot of times, assuming they're a stable patient and they're not overtly dysmic, um, one of the things that we really harp on and, and kind of look for as the better outcome variable to determine if a dog's in heart failure or has pulmonary edema is that resting. So when they're right. calmly resting with the owner of sleeping respiratory rate, we use a cutoff of around 30 breaths per minute. The literature supports that. So if their breathing rate is consistently above 30, and sometimes we give a little wiggle room, 36 breaths per minute, that's the real red flag in a dog with a loud murmur and clinically significant heart disease that we're worried about pulmonary edema. In other words, you can take the opposite. If, if they're eupneic at home, and their breathing rate's consistently less than 30, even though they're coughing, right. I think you can be reasonably confident they're not in heart failure. 
Yeah, and I'm really it, glad you mentioned that. Yeah, because I agree with you on the tachypnea and the and resting uh, re respiratory rates as well. We used to actually send our clients home with these charts because we knew we couldn't get anything really valuable in the clinic, right? They're already sort of, you know, right. a little bit uh, nervous and so forth. So I love the fact that you went ahead and said, hey, if it's more than 30 breaths per minute, we probably need. And we would actually use this also, Lance, to sort of measure, do we need to change medications? How, you know, are we stable and so forth? But let's get back to, to one other question that a lot of times I have, you know, have to answer to clients and and maybe it's young associates, what's the mechanism between this type of tachypnea that we're talking about? You know, because, I mean, obviously, I know volume is going to play, but there's there's some other factors that you might want to touch on as well. Yeah, as far as what's causing the tachypnea, I, I, I think that's just an overall uh, sign, one of the more subtle ones, at least, uh, relatively speaking, of decreased lung function. So when you have fluid in the the lower airway specifically specifically the alveoli that's going to pair with oxygen exchange and oxygen delivery and, and oxygenation of the blood so that starts initially and relatively subtly with just resting tachypnea um, and sometimes they can have tachypnea after you know activity or excitement but a probably more objective and more reliable thing to look for is just when they're sleeping or, or resting next to you, uh, counting the number of breaths they take in a minute um, and documenting that. And that's in the setting of pulmonary edema, that's going to be due, due to, you know, decreased lung function from wet lungs, so to speak. Right. And that's what I wanted to say is please don't wait until your client's calling you saying, yeah, I can feel the crackles, you know, when I touch them, when they're laying next to me, that's far too late. Okay. So what about other uh, physical signs that a, that a veterinarian in a clinic or certainly a, patient, a pet parent at home could be monitoring for that also might l help differentiate a cardiac cough, you know, that's more serious, that maybe is tending or trending towards pulmonary edema. So what, what other physical exam findings maybe would you recommend to, to look for? Yeah, I, I think... Um... I think one of the more important ones is is if the cough worsens or becomes progressive. We certainly don't want to ignore that. Um, but unfortunately, I would say some of the more uh, you know understanding, at least uh, is the way I think of it, that throws some nuance into this. We we I don't think there is necessarily other reliable features about the cough specifically that's going to help us differentiate. This is a cardiac cough versus this is an airway cough. I think a lot of those things, you know, that that we used to think about wet or productive coughs or cough associated with lying down or nocturnal coughs. I think there's now, at least in my mind, more and more gray zone between cardiac cough versus non-cardiac cough. So for me, something I want to emphasize is. Um, uh, more the tachypnea, that's going to be the better differentiator from uh, your physical exam or history uh, if the owner is already, already already monitoring it. I will add, like you said, there's, there's um, some great apps out there. I think BI has one as well as um, uh, there's a Cardalis one or a SIVA one. It doesn't matter. I just think really emphasizing making a log because even trends within the same patient can be important. Yeah. So I wish there were some more specific features about the cough that would help us differentiate heart failure or cardiac cough versus airway disease, but there really isn't. The only other thing I would quickly add is like, maybe sometimes step one, is it actually a cough? Because as you know, right. as experienced um, uh, practitioner, there's a lot of things out there that sound like a cough, like right. owners will confuse them, reverse sneezing, right. um, retching, sometimes even vomiting. Uh, so having that video recording with cell phones everywhere these days can be a huge advantage. Yeah, I love that. And, and again, now let's let's go back over to this distinguishing between cardiac cough and just other forms of chronic cough. Because as you mentioned, number one, it can be difficult at home sometimes for pet parents to distinguish between a cough versus reverse sneeze versus a variety of other noises. But for us as veterinarians, what are some of the other chronic coughs that we want to rule out before we just jump right in saying this is, this is cardiac cough? Absolutely. I think... Um... For me, I'm biased by my type of practice, obviously cardiology practice. So we are probably, you know, more specifically referring to 
the relatively chronic cough. So this isn't an acute onset per se. So this is a cough that's been going on a while. How you specifically define that, I would say at least over a couple of weeks. So with that context in mind, there's the big three, particularly in these um, older or middle-aged to older small breed dogs, but you can include the larger breed dogs in this too. And that's kind of the big three is what I like to call it, that the so-called cardiac cough, so coughing at least associated with uh, cardiomegaly and clinically significant heart, heart disease. Uh, chronic bronchitis would be another really common cause of chronic cough. And then this is probably more the smaller dogs, but tracheobronchomalacia or so-called tracheal collapse. Those are, are gonna be, and I think most of us in the respiratory internal medicine and cardiology field would agree, those are the kind of the most common causes. So if it's not a cardiac cough um, per se, uh, coughing associated with pulmonary edema, coughing associated with cardiomegaly and bronchial compression, uh, then we got to be we we should start thinking about chronic bronchitis and then tracheobronchomalacia. Now there's other differentials, right. but those, those to me are going to be the big three. Yeah, and I agree with those big three as well. And you should, I mean, most of us should be able to clinically distinguish this on the exam table. So, you know, I, I think most of us, you know, th this, I love the fact that we just, we want to go through the thought process. Don't assume every small dog with a murmur, the cough is caused, you know, caused by the heart disease. So let's now take the next step. So now I've, I've got a patient in front of me. I'm pretty sure, you know, just based on physical exam findings that this is a cardiac cough. What's my next step? Yeah, I, absolutely. So for me, it, I, I, again, I'm biased, but I tend to look, thing, look at things from the lens of cardiac related versus non cardiac related. Um, so two key steps that involve thoracic radiographs, um, as well as the clinical picture, but we've kind of already talked about that, uh, would be, is this dog in left sided congestive heart failure? I, I mentioned the nuance there just because and you did as well. And I appreciate that. Just because the dog is coughing, has a murmur, doesn't mean they have pulmonary edema and they need furosemide, for example. So, but it's an important rule out. So we should start with, is there radiographic evidence of left-sided congestive heart failure? And just really quick, the key things there are gonna be unequivocal left-sided cardiomegaly. Most dogs, the vast majority of them that are in heart failure and coughing have big hearts and it's, it's, it's not, is this maybe big? It's like a pretty straightforward yes or no the vast majority of the time. We also look for pulmonary venous distension. Uh, in my opinion, I, I don't want to send the wrong message. We should look for it, but that's going to be the least consistent. Um, in other words, you can have a dog with overt left-sided congestive heart failure that doesn't have pulmonary venous distension that we can see radiographically. And then the, the opposite is also true. You could have a dog that's not in heart failure that has pulmonary venous distension. So look for it, but don't get too hung up on it. And lastly, in dogs, we're looking for that radiographic evidence of pulmonary edema. Uh, this is something we're probably pretty averse to seeing, uh, or at least you, accustomed to looking for. That's that perihilar caudal dorsal interstitial to alveolar pattern. And, and when it's alveolar, it's usually quite diffuse. So those are things we want to look for. And if we don't see pulmonary edema and we rule out heart failure, particularly if the patient's not tachypnic at rest or sleeping at home, then we want to look for clinically significant cardiomegaly. Yeah. Um, and I can, and, and I can go into more details, but... Yeah, and I definitely, because there's some measurements, I think we want to make sure to remind our veterinary colleagues to take. But, but you know, one, one of the things too, Lance, that I really appreciate the fact is that you, you've really given us a, a very accessible clinical tool. I mean, I think too often vets overlook the value of, of radiology. Like I, like somehow we just fast forwarded into this world of ultrasound and echo in every dog that we think has heart disease. And we're missing a lot of good opportunities because number one, that does require a different level of expertise and equipment. So your investments are different. And number two, you know, it takes greater time. So I love the fact that we can quickly have our veterinary technicians go back, get a couple of views of the chest and, and get a lot of answers. So, I mean, you know, again, um, when do you recommend that we go to an echo cardio? You know, w when do we go to that ultrasound study versus just trying to say, OK, look, guys, first and foremost, let's get a radiograph. Or do you even recommend doing a radiograph right off the bat? Yeah, great questions. Um, 
as I'm a self-declared echo nerd, uh, and just love echo. That's my, my research passion, uh, love it in the clinic advanced to beginner. Uh, and even I will admit in, in this context, in this disease, the most important diagnostic tool is thoracic radiographs. I do agree. There's some interesting kind of, uh, potentially helpful findings with lung ultrasound, but for me, the good old thoracic radiographs paired with the, the clinical picture of the patient, the history, the physical exam is of the utmost importance. Um, so I think in any patient with a left sided systolic murmur fitting the bill for presumed myxomatous mitral valve disease. So that's a middle aged to older dog, particularly the smaller dogs, um, the thoracic radiographs, even if they're not coughing, I think that can be immensely valuable, but, um, you know, if nothing else, just to follow heart size. Um, we've talked about that in the past, but now we're talking about the symptomatic patient with the cough. So I think, uh, you know, the cardiologist in me will say, I, I think it's important to at least offer the heart ultrasound, whether you're doing heart ultrasound or that's done by a board certified cardiologist. I, I do think the cardiologist or an expert experienced sonographer is ideal. But I think it's important to offer it, but realize that I don't think that's the most important in most of the cases. Now, is it ideal to have both? Absolutely it is. But if I were to pick one, particularly the more, uh, you know, practical or, or ubiquitous diagnostic tool in a coughing dog with a left-sided murmur, it'd be thoracic radiographs. Yeah. And again, I, think I just think it's, and I love the fact we're just, you know, again, I, ideally you're going to do both and even more, but uh, the reality is you're going to have some clients with financial constraints, time constraints, maybe even your level of access to an echo is, is limited. So, you know, we, I just want to make sure that, that veterinary colleagues don't, I, I fear sometimes Lance that they go, well, I can't diagnose this because I don't have the equipment necessary for the gold standard and just nothing could be further from the truth. You know, I, I used to joke to, to my younger vets all the time. I was like, look, all I really need in clinical practice is a good set of ears, eyes, hands, and a, a radiograph, <laughs> you know, because I can go a long, long way with that. And I need a lot, I want some biomarkers in your analysis, but you, you know, Lance, you, you, that imaging is so important. And I think that I just don't want you to ever think I can't somehow manage or help this patient because I don't have certain bits of equipment. Uh, and since most state, you know, medical boards require you to have a radiographic machine on premise, you know, I'm kind of like, let's start there. So I appreciate that. Okay. So now, uh, uh, what about, uh, you know, kind of a, I don't know if you have any slides that you could share with us, but, you know, going back to, I, I think one of the most transformative things in my career was when we started doing vertebral heart scoring, right? Because back in the day, we would look and we could tell there was, you know, a, a left, you know, you know, either atrial or ventricular. And large, I mean, we could tell grossly, but we didn't have any objective measurements to compare that with. You know, it's like, oh, I've seen a hundred of these and this one's definitely enlarged. Tell us about the vertebral heart score. And I know there's been some changes to it. In fact, there's been and one really, I think, valuable addition to this type of scoring. But tell us about when do you go to this, and and how do you fa how does that factor into your diagnosis? You bet. Um, well, I think it, it assessing heart size serves you know multiple purposes. Again, in a coughing patient with a murmur, you know, to help rule in or rule out um, a cardiac cough or congestive heart failure as a cause, which is a, again a really important differential. Um, particularly in a patient that's tachypnic at rest. Um, but even if they're not, I think it's important to rule out. Um, that involves thoracic radiographs, as we've talked about. And in, in ruling out left-sided congestive heart failure, number one, and number two, clinically significant cardiomegaly. And within that component of congestive heart failure is cardiomegaly like we talked about. So I think particularly if you're not looking at thor thoracic radiographs every day, multiple times a day, like myself or, or radiologists, you hit the nail on the head there. I think these objective measurements of heart size, they're, they're not perfect. They have flaws, absolutely, but they can be helpful the vast majority of the time, particularly from um, if you're not looking at these every day. And it helps kind of get us all on the same page. So let's assume we're looking at a dog like this. This dog has a cough. Um, we would want three view radiographs, obviously, or at least two orthogonal views at minimum to rule out congestive heart failure. So in this coughing dog, let's just quickly make the assumption that 
The dog's Eupnik at home, uh, we've confirmed that, or maybe even we got lucky, Eupnik in the clinic, breathing rates less than 30. So right then and there, that's powerful information that this dog is unlikely experiencing cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So if their breathing rate is less than 30, I'm not already thinking this dog doesn't need furosemide, but wait, why is he coughing? Well, one theory like we talked about is airway compression and that irritating airways. And could that cardiomegaly or left atrial enlargement be irritating airways? Now, some of the more nuanced research I mentioned earlier kind of has questioned that whether that's a slam dunk or not. So realize cardiomegaly causing cough it isn't always the case in all of these dogs, but I still think it's worth ruling out. So again, how do we be objective with this? Well, there's two measurements now, as you alluded to. So I'll start with vertebral left atrial size, kind of the newer one. Again, I've highlighted that we tend to recommend doing this on the right lateral or at minimum be consistent. So if you only got that left lateral, uh, particularly if you're following a patient over time, uh, do it again on the left lateral. But we tend to recommend the right lateral. So we draw a line for vertebral left atrial size from the central ventral border of the carina, or at least what this radiolucent circle or oval structure is. So from the central ventral border of that, I'm gonna draw a line to where the back of that backpack is, of where we think the left atrium is. Remember, dogs with left atrial enlargement have straightening of this dorsal caudal cardiac waist. Normally it tucks in right towards the carina. So I draw a line just measuring the kind of width of where the left atrium is, about where that intersects with the dorsal border of the caudal vena cava here, because we had to standardize it in the apical to basilar plane. So I take the length of that line and I index it to the number of vertebral bodies. Now we tend to use the fourth thoracic vertebrae kind of as our starting point. So I count the dorsal spinous processes, one, two, three, four. And this line is the exact same length as this one. So we can see this dog's vertebral left atrial size is over three vertebrae. Now I'll give you some cutoffs uh, in a little bit, but a big left atrium, I'll, I'll give them right now actually for this score, is probably around three vertebrae, 2.8 to three. So when I have a vertebral left atrial size approaching three or at least three vertebral bodies, that is a clinically significant cardiomegaly. And for me, without an echo, assuming the owner has declined that, that's an example of where I would empirically be comfortable prescribing pimobendin for this dog's cardiomegaly. All right, let's transition real quick to vertebral heart size. This one we're all probably a little bit more familiar with. So same thing, central ventral border of the carina, the furthest distance down to the apex of the heart. So that's just measuring the apical to basilar length. Then I'm going to draw a second line roughly within the central one third, the widest point of the cardiac silhouette. It usually intersects around the ventral border of the caudal cava here. And we're just going to do the exact same thing. We're going to draw lines the exact same length. So these two dotted lines are the same length. And then I'm going to index that. I'm going to add in those vertebral bodies so you can view it there on the screen a little bit better. And I'm just going to count the number of vertebral bodies within this line as well as the yellow line, which is the exact same length here. And we're gonna get a number of vertebral bodies again, which will pop up on the screen for this dog. So for this dog's vertebral left atrial size um, is 3.1, the vertebral heart score was 13.5. Now, what's a good number to remember for vertebral heart size? I would say at least 11.5 vertebral bodies. And for those of you that know what normal is, that's well above normal. So again, we can err on the side of specificity or increasing our confidence that this dog truly does have clinically significant cardiomegaly. And there's multiple independent studies out there now that show us, hey, these measurements, if you're meeting a VLAS or VLAS of a three or more and a vertebral heart score of 11 and a half or more, that um, correlates with echo measurements where we prompt starting vetmedin or pimobendin uh, therapy. So again, we've ruled out pulmonary edema first and foremost. So that helps us decide whether they need Lasix and vetmedin in, in this example. So this dog is coughing and has cardiomegaly. So my kind of treatment approach is, hey, let's work on treating the heart disease first, lowering left atrial pressure. Pimobendin is a fantastic drug to reduce heart size 
uh, among its other mechanisms of action. And a lot of times these dogs with big hearts that are coughing, while they don't necessarily know the exact mechanism, other than we've ruled out pulmonary edema because this dog in this example is resting or breathing rates less than 30, a lot of times their cough will improve once you prescribe uh, vetmedin or, or pimobenin in this scenario. So that's my recommended initial approach there. Let's confirm they've got objective measurement uh, of consistent with clinically significant cardiomegaly once we've ruled out pulmonary edema so I can decide whether they'll benefit from pimobenin. And a lot of times, Dr. Ward, their cough will respond to that medin in and of itself. Not always. And we can get into that if you want. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, vet medin is the game changer. You know, I mean, we were using it a long time ago off label. It's just phenomenal. But I want to go back one other little bit because I do find a lot of young veterinarians in particular uh, have less confidence in performing a VLAS or a VHS, a vertebral heart score. And I, I really want you to sort of give them a level of confidence because, you know, I, I agree with you. Like these, if, if they're showing 11, oh, wow, you know, that's a big heart without a doubt. Uh, give them some level of confidence that they can capture with, you know, fair accuracy, you know, these measurements. Because it's, you know, people are always like, well, is it 0.1 or 0.2? And honestly, we're missing the point, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another pun intended. Great point. I mean, these cutoffs are kind of well above what's considered normal versus abnormal, and rightfully so. Um, this is this prompts initiation of a lifelong medication. Now, I think we can all be pretty confident that, that a drug like pimobendin has a very low side effect profile. That said, though, we want to be confident that these dogs actually will benefit from it. So that's where these cutoffs are designed, and that's what Vetmedin CA1 is, is currently has conditional approval for. If the echo is declined, using these measurements of, of, of three or more and 11.5 or more to start um, chronic and lifelong therapy with, with pimobendin. But to your point or your question about these measurements, it, it's, it's, it's not going to matter whether you're 0.1 or 0.2 vertebrae off just based on the specificity from the data from the literature that generated these cutoffs. I think it's just a matter of doing it. Um, right. Now, I will admit some dogs you can't see borders of their cardio, cardiac silhouette yeah, very well. Right. Some of them have, you know, lung masses. So obviously that's a limitation of the measurement, but it's just a matter of, of doing it. And you can be, you don't have to be that precise within 0.1 or 0.2 vertebrae in this context based off these cutoffs. So yeah, and, and, and my experience, Lance, I mean, the most important thing is to have a good positioning. You know, I, I know you mentioned doing yeah. a, a left uh, lateral, but you know, the reality is you do want your techs to be trained to give you a really good flat image. You know, I mean, these need to be still images. I mean, you know, I think all the good practices that we would normally associate with with any type of radiology, but but I think that's the biggest thing. You know, when I see, I, every now and then, y'all, a vet will send me an x-ray or something. And it's all, you know, <laughs> they're completely, you know, when the, uh, when the spine looks like you know a rainbow then you're like okay i don't know that i can really give you a much of an assessment here but let's get back to that okay so now we've we've done our we've got our patient in front of us it's coughing we feel like it's of cardiac origin we've done now a vlas and a vertebral heart score and they both show enlargement of the of the left side of the heart left ventricle left atrium you know however we want to dis describe that and now you've mentioned that okay this is a case that is appropriate and even approved for use of of that madden so so kind of walk us through that process again and, and what are my follow-ups? Because like you, I've seen a lot of amazing post-treatment radiographic changes. But so walk us through, we're now in front of us, what kind of dosing rec rec recommendations do you have? You know, just sort of those things we can do to, to have that conversation with the client. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so so in our patient, again, we're, we're not thinking this, we ruled out congestive heart failure. So that's a, a different um, topic, but that's radiographic pulmonary edema paired with clinical signs, that would prompt treatment with furosemide, pimobendin, potentially an ACE inhibitor. But we're not talking about that scenario right now in this patient. This is a patient that, that is coughing. We've just done our vertebral heart score, our vertebral left atrial size. And by the way, um, I don't necessarily think you have to do both, just my personal opinion. I'm thrilled if people do at least just one of them, just add some quantitation or objectivity. Do I think it's ideal to be both and they're both above the cutoffs? 
that's going to increase our confidence of, of heart enlargement even more. That's great. But some people, you know, maybe they're confused about uh, one of the measurements. They're not comfortable with it. That That's okay. Um, at, at least in my opinion, I, I think the label for vet medin does recommend both fulfilling both. So be aware of that. Um, but let's say, uh, yeah, we've got our vertebral left atrial size of 3.1. We've got our vertebral heart score well above 11 and a half and 13.5 in a coughing dog. I'm going to, that's going to prompt starting, uh, vet medin. And I think the label dose or the label dose is, a good number to remember is 0.25 mix per kg twice daily. So I, I don't think you need to go above the, the labeled dose there or the conditionally improved dose for, for dog knot and heart failure. So that's a good number. Um, I tend to round up if I'm in between. Again, pimobendin is really safe uh, in that context. So rounding up is just an easy thing to remember. So um, kind of next steps based off that, though, is I'm going to give the dog roughly a week hey, I'm, I'm not seeing obvious lung masses or pneumonia. Keep in mind, we want to rule out some of the other obvious, maybe less common, but important causes of cough. Assuming we don't see any other causes of cough on all three of those views, I'm just going to see if vet medin will, will help that dog's cough with the theory or the hope that reducing heart size and reducing left atrial pressure might relieve some of that compression of airways and you know it doesn't work in all of them, but I'm gonna at least give that 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 um, pimobendin a chance to work roughly seven to ten days or so. And so now I know I've got that dog's heart disease kind of under control and the best medication we know to delay the onset of heart failure, and it might help with their cough if their cough is due to uh, cardiomegaly. So sometimes you can kind of kill two birds with one stone there. Some of these dogs, their cough doesn't improve. So there's a lot of options as far as next steps there. I'm still thinking even if, if I've ruled out another obvious cause of their cough, again, like aspiration pneumonia or you know pulmonary neoplasia or evidence of heartworm disease. A heartworm antigen is, depending on the region of the country, is never a bad idea in a dog with a cough, particularly if you're seeing uh, other radiographic changes or even if you're not, it's a pretty cheap screening test. Uh, that's something else that we'll, we'll do uh, quite commonly. Um, but from there, as far as treatment, if their cough persists, you have a lot of options. Uh, and that usually means there, there aren't many good ones or we don't have a consensus. But one option would be a referral to an internist for maybe a bronchoscopy BAL. Um, a lot of owners, understandably, aren't going to do that. And, and I certainly get that. Some other clinicians prefer a trial of antibiotics, you know, uh, and, and that's, I guess, somewhat reasonable. Doxycycline probably would be my preferred uh, favorite if I'm thinking if there is an infectious component. So um, roughly five mix per kg BID for doxycycline. I would probably give them a week or two to see if their cough responds to that. Um, and at least my personal approach is, assuming... Uh, again, I don't see another obvious cause. I'm going to presume they've got airway inflammation, either from tracheobronchomalacia or chronic bronchitis, uh, if I'm not seeing other uh, ra obvious radiographic signs of disease. And I wouldn't hesitate, particularly after I've tried doxycycline, for anti-inflammatory prednisone. It's certainly not my first choice, uh, because we all are familiar with the side effects of corticosteroids. But I'll do just a three to four week taper, starting at half a mg per kg twice daily and just tapering them down from there. Yeah. And Lance, I can tell you, I've, I've been in that situation so many times in my career. And and honestly, once you it's, it's sort of like a allergic you know, dermatitis. Once you kind of get that initial insult calmed down, so to speak, uh, they, they really go on to do well. But again, I, I agree with you only after ruling out everything else. Uh, and and again, you know, if you're out there on the fence about vet medin with these cases, I would say you're going to be pleasantly surprised. I mean, it not only is it a lifesaver, literally, but it is going clients love it because I, I 
I'll say, Lance, uh, the majority, you know, I'm going to bet that they're going to almost have all clinical resolution within that first week or two. I mean, that's been my experience. Obviously, I have different cases than you that are less complicated, probably. But, you know, vet med during that first week or two and people like, oh, yeah, he's breathing better. He's more active. He's going outside. He's eating, you know, all those things that they weren't seeing. So I, I love the fact. And again, the quarter mig, you know, per keg twice a day. I think that's a good starting point. I, I have on occasion increase that over time any any do you give any insight on on that approach and you know again I, i'm not saying like i you know quadrupled it necessarily but i i always i i have escalated it up and tiered up uh when i didn't see a uh, response yep um i would say within this context uh i i haven't up tried traded uh Pimabin, and obviously we should know this is off label but um where i've done it more and had had luck uh, in the, in a different contest is is the dog with refractory pulmonary edema. Um, that's where you know we don't have a lot of data, but s- some data is starting to emerge that there might be a dose dependent effect of this drug in terms of reducing heart size further. Now, obviously, the we don't just want to ramp it up uh, large or high doses, so I tend to do that or think about doing that with refractory congestive heart right. failure, where their pulmonary edema is the problem. Um, but it, it's not to say it's it's contraindicated by any means for for coughing. So that's a um, an, another strategy that might be useful. Yeah, and we're talking yeah, I, like maybe a twenty five percent increase in the dose. Yeah, right. Yeah, and Lance, again, I, I probably didn't clarify. These are those cases that you know fail or they sort of relapse or whatever you want to call it. You know, so over time, you know, you we, I wind up I wind up you know kind of moving up a little bit here and there before adding different drugs. Uh, and certainly, furosemide is always going to be our first add. And that's that leads us to kind of another question before we go into a complicating factor with upper airway disease. But when do you initiate uh, furosemide? I mean, do you want clinical evidence of uh, pulmonary edema? Do you want just uh, you know so radiographic evidence, or do you want just clinical symptoms? I mean, when do you say now's the time? Yeah, great question, great time for that question. Segues right in, kind of with progressing. So for me, it's kind of both. I want, but if I, I, have, I have to pick one, um, I would pick the clinical signs. Heart failure for me is a clinical syndrome defined by clinical signs. So that can be as subtle as elevated resting or sleeping respiratory rate. Again, that 30 to 36 breath per minute cutoff. If that dog is consistently above that, I'm going to worry that dog's in congestive heart failure, assuming they have a loud murmur uh, and they're an older, especially small breed dog. Now, it's ideal to have thoracic radiographs. So, and, and again, we've talked about how those are pretty much in every practice now to look for radiographic evidence of pulmonary edema. Um, So absolutely, I would recommend seeing that dog in your clinic. The owner has been monitoring or logging it. Let's do a recheck. Let's let's do a physical exam. Let's um, take a history, see how the cough is doing. But if they are persistently tachypneic, that's another indication to do a thoracic radiograph to look for pulmonary edema. Um, radiographically. Again, perihilar, caudal dorsal, interstitial infiltrates uh, is, is mostly what we're looking for. That's easier said than done and maybe a different <laughs> conversation. But the, um, right. so that's what we're looking to document um, that tachypnea uh, paired with those radiographic findings for me prompts furosemide. Um, and maybe we could get into just, just a little bit. A lot of people use furosemide trials for these coughing dogs. And what I'll say to add nuance to that, Lasix will improve a lot of dogs cough, right? But it doesn't necessarily prove they were in congestive heart failure. Again, that's where we're gonna come back to that tachypnea is that outcome variable. That's what we're looking to improve, not cough. Now that's not to say we should use Lasix to treat cough. I think we have better uh, medications and we're going to have a lot of accidents in the house if we do that. <laughs> I like that. And yeah, and I, I'm with you. I'm really not a big fan of trialing, uh, you know, a diuretic, but that's that's a different, a whole different conversation. Okay, so now let's finally finish up today with, with what I have found personally struggled with over my career. And that is, how do we distinguish, you know, between the dog that just has myxomatous mitral valve disease versus myxomatous mitral valve disease plus an upper airway or an airway disorder. I mean, because yeah, I, I find this confounding at points and I've missed them. You know, I've, I've, I've sort of missed that initial diagnosis and chased the wrong direction and maybe, maybe help me out with that. 
Yeah, you're not alone. I'm I'm a boarded cardiologist now for over 10 years, and I know I've missed them too and got it wrong. That's because this is challenging. But yeah, just some general guidelines, I would say. We've been emphasizing it uh, a lot already. And, and dogs in left-sided congestive heart failure, yeah, I'll put a, a slide up here. Thanks, Dr. Ward. Um, and I'll just put them all out there um, for the sake of time. Are by definition, if they're in heart failure, they're tachypnic. So if it's airway disease and they're primarily coughing from airway disease and incidentally like a lot of these old dogs do have um a myxomatous mitral valve disease they're rarely to get to get rest now what i'm talking about here is the dog with tracheal collapse or chronic bronchitis again so airway disease with incidental mitral disease so dog and heart failure they, they often have at least tachypnea, often with respiratory difficulty, and they may or may not cough. With the dogs with primary respiratory disease and maybe incidental mitral valve disease, cough is often their main clinical sign. Another one that is pretty simple that, that, that can get overlooked, though, is most dogs, the vast majority of them, in left side congestive heart failure are tachycardic. What's probably more helpful from your physical exam finding is a dog in the clinic if they're not tachycardic, that makes heart failure less likely. So a lot of these dogs with primary airway disease that are coughing, that are not in heart failure, they might have a normal heart rate or even a respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Again, you can it's a slippery slope here, but we also try to use murmur. Um, I guess the obvious extremes are the most helpful. So for example, if a dog doesn't have a murmur, that makes congestive heart failure from myxomatous mitral valve disease, pretty much impossible. These dogs almost always have moderate to severely loud murmurs that you're not gonna miss. Um, crackles sometimes uh, we think about as, is associated primarily with pulmonary edema. That's not necessarily true. Dogs with primary airway disease. I mean, basically anything that can get into the interstitium of the lung, scar tissue, hemorrhage, inflammatory infiltrate, that can cause crackles. So I'll just kind of warn you, crackles does not necessarily mean a dog's in heart failure from pulmonary edema. We talked about cardiomegaly already. If a dog doesn't have cardiomegaly, if they're less than the normal reference value, so vertebral heart score, that's gonna be 10.5 to 10.7. If they're less than that, it's it's very uncommon for that dog to be in left-sided heart failure. Same with VLAS. If their vertebral left atrial size is less than 2.3, 2.2, that's going to be the normal cutoff, normal versus abnormal. It's very unlikely that dog's in left-sided congestive heart failure. Um, dogs with chronic airway disease like tracheal bronchomalacia or chronic bronchitis often have radiographically normal lungs. We kind of think about chronic bronchitis and they might have a bronchial pattern. That's not necessarily true until it's the very end stage. And the last two kind of bullet points are there. Uh, we've kind of already talked about. So the tachypnea is our outcome variable. That's what we're looking for to respond to Lasix. And again, it's, it's confusing. A cough in a dog without any heart disease whatsoever might respond to Lasix. That doesn't mean to imply Lasix should be used to treat their cough it probably dries out their airways and secretions and at least temporarily alleviates their cough, but it's not a great long-term solution. And sometimes we learn about this in a very backwards way. A lot of owners might forget to fill their Lasix prescription and they were started on it for presumably right. congestive heart failure. And if they go days to weeks without their Lasix, they weren't in heart failure, right? A dog truly exactly. in heart failure would die from lack of Lasix. Oh, gosh, I love it. I, I'll tell you, that is uh, that is so true, guys, because if your clients aren't screaming and banging on the door saying, I'm out of my Lasix, <laughs> their dog may not need it. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a heads up on that because, uh, yeah, that's one of those things. It's like insulin. I mean, you know, you cannot you can't miss a dose or two. I mean, because they fill up and they're drowning. So, I mean, uh, again, guys, I, I can't thank enough uh, for Dr. Lance Visser spending time with us today. Lance, uh, sort of in that last uh, little bit here, you know, when you're Speaking especially to younger associates who maybe haven't managed as many cases of cardiac disease yet, um, what's that last bit of advice that you'd like to give them? And not only you know determining if it's truly you know a, a cardiac cough, but also you know that they can have complete confidence in, in vet med. Yeah, just uh, kind of 
what we've been harping on a little bit in, in important to reemphasize is, is your physical exam finding. Sometimes things as simple as your respiratory rate and heart rate, as I've alluded to, as well as the thoracic radiographs. I couldn't emphasize the importance of those enough and especially being objective um, to, to get comfortable with measuring, doing these measurements. You actually have to, to do them. I know that's mind blowing. And ideally, uh, if you have a more experienced practitioner in your practice that can kind of give you some guidance on them or you can ask for feedback, uh, that's going to be helpful too. But um, you just have to start practicing it and, and get familiar with those numbers. It, they're, they're relatively simple measurements to do that can make a world of difference. And I will lastly say, you just get surprised a lot, particularly in these Yorkies, Pomeranians, Chihuahuas. Their hearts look big on the lateral radiograph, for example, but you actually measure them. Uh, they might not measure big. So bringing some objectivity into our world, particularly if you're not used to looking at these. And you just your stethoscope, like you alluded to earlier, Dr. Ward, sometimes even a murmur yes or no is more helpful than uh, maybe some of our more advanced diagnostics like like lung ultrasound or a BNP or something. So just and I'll tell you too, guys. Uh, you know, if you're a young associate out there, I, I will say that if you are looking to make the most difference clinically in a patient's life, learn cardiology. I mean, Lance, I am jealous of you because that you are the hero of so many cases, and I love I love it. You know, when I graduated from University of Georgia, you know, back in the Stone Ages, I mean, I was a little intimidated by cardiology, but I quickly embraced it as a young practitioner and, and then as a practice owner, and I realized, wow, there is so much good that we can do just with a little bit of attention and focus, and and literally with drugs coming along like vet medin. I mean, it just changed the whole game. So, guys, if you are sitting on the fence, afraid in any way, shape, or form about cardiology, number one, always go see somebody like Dr. Lance Fitzer. When they when he's out there lecturing, it's phenomenal. And I still, at 31, 32 years in, I learn something every time I hear you speak. So again, thank you so much, uh, uh, Lance, for joining us. I'm flattered. And like Dr. Ward said, I am here to help. I think he'll, he'll have access to my email. Um, but yeah, we just want to help. Uh, and we realize not all these patients can come see us cardiologists. Or they do not necessarily need to, but sometimes it's just boosting your confidence and giving you confidence on when to start a cardiac medication. I agree. I've found some people either love or hate cardiology, but uh, I want to try to break down that stigma as much as I can. Love, 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 love. Well, guys, I want to thank Baringer Ingelheim, BI, for not only creating drugs like vet med that save lives, but also for bringing content like that, like this, to you, the Vertical Vet family. I really want to thank Dr. Lance Visser. He is incredibly busy out there at Colorado State University, saving lives and conducting research. And again, I want to thank him. If you want to learn more, you can contact us at Vertical Vet or verticalvet.com. Another fantastic website that I actually love is vetmedden.com. If you have not gone there, just go ahead and do it right now. Vetmedden.com by Boehringer Ingelheim. There are so many tools and resources that you can use in clinic and send home with your clients and so forth. It is a phenomenal resource for busy practitioners. So again, thank you to Boehringer Ingelheim, one of our preferred partners here at Vertical Vet. Thank you to Dr. Lance Visser for joining us today. And thank you, the Vertical Vet family, because we are here now, over 1,400 clinics strong around the United States with one simple goal, and that is to come together to share best ideas and help each other thrive. This is so much more than a GPO. This is a community. This is a movement. We are trying to transform the way we think of veterinary medicine. And with your help and the fantastic Vertical Vet team, we are accomplishing that. So again, on behalf of the entire phenomenal Vertical Vet family, I am Dr. Ernie Ward, Chief Veterinary Officer. We will talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.